Hey everyone, welcome back to the Imperial Minis channel. This is Randall, and today we're going to be discussing the Men at Arms that were revealed in the second Brotherhood Without Banners preview article on the Simon website. We previously discussed the exciting Brotherhood Sworn Knights Cavalry unit in our previous video, and we'll be providing similar coverage to the Men at Arms in this video, and to the Brotherhood Archers in a forthcoming video. If you haven't seen the Sworn Knights video, there's a link in the description and at the end of the video. Before we dive into this new unit, I would like to just echo my previous enthusiasm for this new Brotherhood Without Banners faction. From everything we've seen and heard so far, this faction looks like it will hit the ground running as a powerful and well-designed faction. We haven't seen their base tactics deck yet, however, and more than anything, the tactics deck really determines the general vibe and power level potential of a faction. So we'll probably do a tactics deck breakdown video once that information has been released. The Brotherhood Without Banners starter box includes four combat units. We can reasonably assume that two of those units will be the peasants since they appear to form the core of the army, which will then be supplemented by the more elite men-at-arms and the one unit of Brotherhood archers. Before ever seeing the unit card, I assumed the men-at-arms would be an elite seven-point unit, in the same vein as the Baratheon Kingsmen or the Stark Winterfell Guards. Now, I turned out to be more or less correct in terms of the unit design and stats, but I was definitely overvaluing these guys on points. They only cost 6 points rather than 7. But let's take a closer look at their unit card to see if the points cost is justified on them or if you're really getting a bargain. In terms of base stats, these guys have a standard 5 movement speed for a medium armored infantry unit. Their to hit value is a mediocre 4 plus, but we'll see in a moment how that might be a non-issue most of the time. Their attack dice values are 764, which is pretty solid for the first two ranks, but really drops off a cliff on one rank. Defensively, these guys are quite resilient for a 6-point unit. They have 4-plus armor and 6-plus morale, putting them in the same defensive realm as various other 5- or 6-point infantry units of various factions. So their defensive stats are good to average, but definitely not bad. From a base stats perspective, the men-at-arms look like a pretty standard 6-point infantry unit. This unit's abilities, however, are what really turn them up in quality. First, they have Ambush, a familiar ability to most players. It gives your target a panicked and weakened token when you charge them in the flank or rear. Ambush can be a really solid ability when you believe you can reliably charge something in the flank. On paper, this unit doesn't really have anything going for it in terms of movement shenanigans to support the ambush ability. I believe there's a lot we're not seeing here though, especially in terms of the faction's base tactics deck and attachments that might better support this ability, but we'll discuss this later. The lead developer, Felipe Galeno, said in his interview with the Under the Hedge Gaming Channel that the Brotherhood Without Banners faction would be a high mobility faction. Since we haven't seen a lot of that mobility yet on the unit cards themselves, it's fair to assume that the tactics deck and or attachments will be strong in terms of movement tricks. We'll take a look in a moment at, the, at a demonstration of some possible combos of abilities that could support this ambush ability, but first we'll uh, finish looking at the unit's card. And then, if anybody hasn't seen the Under the Hedge Gaming channel's interview with Felipe, I'll put a link to that in the uh, video description. The unit's last ability, Brotherhood Armaments, gives the unit Critical Blow as standard, and if your opponent does not control the crown, this unit also gains plus one to hit and sundering. This is a pretty huge offensive bonus as it moves the unit's base stats into more elite territory and gives it the best offensive keyword in the game, sundering. So without your opponent controlling the crown, this unit is hitting on a 3 plus with 7 dice at full ranks with Critical Blow and sundering. And as we mentioned in our Sworn Knights video, Crown is generally the least desirable zone, so there's a good shot that the opponent won't grab it early unless they are desperate or brought along Peter Baelish, Alistair Florent, Joffrey Baratheon, or some other options that we'll discuss later. This is a good moment to point out just how many Crown-dependent abilities the Brotherhood Without Banners has so far. Let's look very quickly at some, and remember there will certainly be more Crown dependencies in the Tactics deck if the unit ability synergies are any indication. These are all the abilities that we know of so far that are on Brotherhood unit cards and unit attachment cards. These guys definitely don't want their opponent to control the crown, making it imperative for Brotherhood players' opponents to prepare for this if they want to reduce the power level of the brother Brotherhood players' army. This crown synergy opens up the opportunity for Brotherhood players to greatly increase the power of their unit's abilities, and presumably the power of their tactics cards. But this crown synergy is a double-edged sword. If the opponent is able to counter the crown control mechanic, the Brotherhood army will have some of the wind taken out of its sails. I won't explain in detail how this crown control can be countered or manipulated, but the NCUs and the Water Garden zone on the screen now are some of the ways the Brotherhood player's crown mechanic can be confounded. I mentioned before that lead developer Felipe Galeno mentioned that the Brotherhood will be known as a movement faction. 
Let's talk about this a bit more and focus on how this could benefit the men at arms. Looking first at the preview article on the men at arms written by War Factory, we see the following passage. We don't want to spoil too much today, but Brotherhood has some tools to make flank charges easier. Let's take a look at what it, some of these tools could be. Here are a sample of possible tactics cards that could achieve the dual purpose of benefiting movement and making flank charges easier. For my money, nothing says making flank charges easier quite like the tactics card Fainting Maneuver that converts a frontal charge into a flank charge. If Fainting Maneuver were in the faction's base tactics deck, that would certainly help cement their place as a flanking, ambushing, guerrilla style faction. If any of these other tactics cards were in the base deck as well, that's even better. I could easily see Sudden Retreat being in there since this faction seems to focus on small folk who might not want to sit in a protracted melee, and then canny, experienced, professional fighters who understand the benefit of a good tactical retreat. Now let's look at something on the attachment side that could benefit this flanking style. Outflank is an ability that is open to several factions, and while it can be difficult to execute properly, it can be devastating when put to use correctly. Just look at all the trouble that Greyjoys cause when one of their units comes back from the dead on a flank table edge. Granted, in that case, there's really not much of an opportunity cost to the quote-unquote outflank versus the standard outflank ability. I'm showing Barrack here as well, since Sentinel is another ability that helps a unit to position themselves for a flank charge. Barrack and a unit of men-at-arms could definitely work its way around to an enemy flank with ease. Before we wrap up this quick look, let's zoom out over the battlefield and look at a what-if scenario of a potential future Imperial Minis battle report and look at the outflank in action. Alright, so this is the battle of the mini factions, and we find ourselves at the end of round two with an outflanked unit of men-at-arms hanging around off the battlefield. Where will they appear? The Bolton player does not know, but either flank would probably be a decent choice. Now we find ourselves at the start of round three. For the sake of this example, let's just say that the men-at-arms appear on the flank of the leftmost unit of Blackguard. Now, when they charge into those Blackguard, since the peasants are already engaged with those Blackguard, the men-at-arms, let's assume they control the crown, are now going to benefit from gang up. So these men-at-arms charging even through that bog will be hitting those black guard in the flank on a two plus to hit with eight dice with critical blow and sundering. So those black guard will go from a three plus armor save to a five plus armor save and be taking eight dice with critical blow on a two plus. Now the Brotherhood archers could easily be the outflanker as well, uh, but we'll explain the possibility of that in the Brotherhood archers video to come. Now, in summary, I think these men-at-arms are a solid six-point unit. Although they compete in the six-point unit slot, they could easily punch above their weight class, depending on crown synergy. Before this unit was previewed, I was thinking about bringing Baratheon Kingsmen in my Brotherhood armies, but looking at these guys, they're basically a slightly less powerful version of that unit. I might just bring these guys instead and use that extra point somewhere else, or bring along a different Baratheon or Stark unit. The way these unit reveals have been going, however, you may not even need to bring a Stark or Baratheon unit to make a solid Brotherhood army. Now, to address the clickbaity subtitle of the video, Are These Guys Best in Class? If we're talking strictly about 6-point infantry units, I'd say they're in contention. They're probably in a close race with the Iron Victory crew and the Baratheon Halberdiers. If we were to compare them with all 6-point units, the Dothraki Screamers easily have them beat in my opinion. But the 6-point unit bracket is a weird one. Once all the units and tactics cards have finally been revealed, I'll probably put together some videos like I did in the lead-up to the Bolton release, examining the tactics cards and doing some list-building theory crafting. There won't be a painted unit showcase video though, unfortunately, since I won't have my hands on the units until the release date. Alright folks, that does it for this quick preview look at the Brotherhood Men-at-Arms. The Brotherhood Archers were also previewed in the same article described earlier in the video, so look out for that unit preview video to come out soon. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to drop it a like, and please consider subscribing if you haven't done so already. I'd like to know what the community's take on the men-at-arms is, so let me know in the comments below if you think this is a unit you're going to be running in most Brotherhood lists, or if they're going to fall to the wayside in favor of more peasant or cavalry-heavy lists. Are there any combos or creative uses for this unit that I missed? If so, drop them in the comments. Thanks for watching, everyone, and until next time, this is Randall, signing off.